Ciao! This week we're in the land of pizzas, Ferraris and the Renaissance period. You may recognise the canals behind me as being part of one of the most famous cities in the world. They're actually part of the wondrous floating city of Venice, the city that was built on water. This city first began back during the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, when people fleeing barbarians found refuge in the form of the marshy swamplands that were around the northern side of the Adriatic Sea. Initially, they drove wooden stakes in the ground, building platforms on top to keep the houses afloat. Nowadays, Venice is an interconnection of 118 islands and one of the most coveted destinations for romantics in Europe. Getting lost in Venice is always on the agenda, and sometimes it's the most enjoyable part of the trip. The winding alleyway-like streets run side by side with hundreds of beautiful waterways that are lined with artistic shops, eateries and many places to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. The fact that the only traffic you'll find here is on the water just adds to its charm. Venice itself actually has six distinct districts known as the Sestieri. The most known is San Marco, the central touristic hub of Venice where you'll find St Mark's Square. Castello is the largest area having acted as a naval dockyard in the past. Rialto Bridge and the area located around it is another well-known district, San Polo. Alternatively, a beautiful area to explore and escape the main touristy parts is Dorso Duro, filled with indie shops, youngsters and less expensive restaurants. It's actually where you'll find the Santa Maria Church which is located on the opposite side of the water from St Mark's Square. Santa Croce links Venice to the mainland through the road bridge. And finally, the one that we will focus on, Canna Reggio, a Jewish ghetto in Venice. This is actually the most populated area in Venice and one that is rarely visited by travellers. It's true that the train station is located on the edge of this quarter, but often people arriving skip right through towards a busier part of the city. However, it's the place to get the real local feel of Venice's residents, where you'll see washing hanging out on the lines, village-style butcher and bakery shops, and friends and family going for after-work aperitifs. Long ago, this area used to solely host the Jewish community of Venice, who were forced to live in cramped, guarded conditions. This was because of the Catholic Church's opposition to Jews at the time. But when Napoleon Bonaparte conquered the city in 1797, he tore down the walls, removed the curfew and allowed people to roam as they chose. Canon Reggio, being a local area, can often be cheaper than other parts of Venice. Here, you'll find many good places to stop off and have a midday glass of Italian wine. Cantina Aziende Agricoli, a small hole-in-the-wall type bar, is one we'd recommend. The place is run by a Venetian resident and is usually filled with lively locals. No wonder though, it's a glass of the house wine only costs 90 cent here. It's a bargain compared to any of the other tourist areas. As you pass from one side of Canna Reggio to the other, dizzy from one cheap glass of wine too many, you may end up stumbling upon a place for which Venice could arguably hold the world record. Caletta Varisco is one of the narrowest streets in the world and measures an incredible 53 centimetres in some parts. Looking more like a simple alleyway though, I guess people could technically argue that it's more like one than a street. If you're visiting in winter, you'll have to make sure to keep that summer beach body until then in order to squeeze through. Just outside of the Canareggio district, close to Castello, is a rather unique library that's a must-see for book lovers. As you can imagine, a city that is built on water often has its problems with flooding. One place that tries to make the most of it in a creative way though is Liberia Aqua Alta. The way this place stores its books is amazing and they will use quite literally anything as a quirky alternative to shelves. You'll find new and old books stored in and on furniture, gondolas, boats, canoes and even a bathtub. They even made a staircase at the back of their store that's completely made up of old encyclopedias and if you climb it, 
you'll get a fantastic view over the canals below. You'll find items typical to Venice making up the other decorative parts of the store, with oars, poles, mannequins with carnival masks, and even a couple of unavoidable Venetian cats hiding between the pages. The Grand Canal in Venice is almost four kilometres long and makes a large reverse S shape through the central districts. It has four bridges in total on it, but until 1854, Rialto Bridge was the only place people could cross by foot, with most citizens taking boats to get around. Since then, it has now become one of the most popular places in Venice, with thousands of people visiting it every day to cross the narrowest point of the Grand Canal on their way between San Polo and San Marco. The bridge hasn't always been as sturdy as it seems, and it's actually collapsed three times in the past, including one time when too many people were standing on it watching a boat show. So if you're here at a busy point, make sure you don't jump up and down, as I wouldn't want you to end up in the Grand Canal after all. Thankfully though, for this reason, a competition was held to design the new bridge in stone instead of wood. It still stands today, and due to the fact that there is no support in the middle, it is considered an engineering marvel for the time it was built. The bridge itself has many overpriced touristic shops on it, and the best thing you can do is skip these and head northwards to the Rialto Market. If you follow the streets, keeping close to the Grand Canal, you can't miss it. Here, you'll find a thousand year old fresh vegetable and fish market that enjoys new deliveries every day. From first light, barges can be seen arriving at the market delivering the new food, with customers and chefs beginning to trade up and down to try and barter a better price for themselves. The food is all labelled with where it came from, and most of the time is as close as the island of Sant Erasmo, a mere five kilometres away. If not though, it's highly likely they'll be imported from another part of Italy. Around midday, everyone will start to shut up shop, so it's best to arrive as early as possible to get the best picks. The market runs from Tuesdays through to Saturday. According to locals, it's a bad idea to order fish in Venice's restaurants on Mondays, since the chefs apparently all shop here and it wouldn't be as fresh. Talking of food, the tradition here in Venice is to enjoy cecchetti. Cecchetti are small tapas-like portions of food that can often be seen being served in traditional bars called bicari. They're unique to Venice and considered as a bar snack, frequently being served with wine. In many of the wine bars around the city, they have stalls right beside the bar due to its popularity. So even if it's just for a small snack, locals here are rarely seen with cecchetti and no wine. Getting a selection of these are easily enough for a meal, and most places have a great selection on offer. Calamari kebabs, meatballs, mozzarella and breadcrumbs, and mini paninis are some examples of what you may find. A highly rated place to try a few pieces of this is Alla Ciorma. The name of the place translates to the crew, and it is fitting since the inside of this tiny bar is like the inside of a boat. The cecchetti here range from 1 euro to 2 euro 50 depending on what you choose, so it's easy to enjoy if you're on a budget. On the east side of the Rialto market, make your way down the street to Cali Donzella and turn left onto Cali Galeazza, the second street running horizontally to Donzella to find it. Alternatively, another place to try these delicious snacks is Al Bottegon. Slightly further away in the Dorsoduro region is still well worth a visit. Every day, the Queen of Cecchetti, Alessandra de Respinas, prepares 60 recipes to choose from behind the glass counter at 1 euro 20 each. She's had plenty of time to tweak them to perfection as well, having ran the shop for 50 years now. Oh, did we mention, they also have a great wine selection. This one is close to the Academia Bridge, but I think it's one you'll have to Google Map to find. What's the best way to tell your stomach you're finished eating for the time being? Ice cream. And if you're still in the Rialto area, a great place to get acquainted with 
the sizzle. They have a huge selection of different ice creams from basic to more unusual flavours. Since it's tucked neatly away from the bustling crowds, the prices are reasonable at 1.80 a scoop. And since the portion sizes here are so massive, sometimes that's all you need. After crossing the Rialto Bridge to the San Marco side of Venice, walk straight until you come to a fork in the road. Take a left here and go through the underpass on your right, the end of the plaza. Keep walking straight until you come to the shop. No visit to Venice is complete without at least seeing a gondola passing you by on one of the many canals and hurriedly trying to get yourself in a picture with it. Although they can be quite expensive to go on, there are a few options on how to ride them on the cheap. For starters, don't ride alone. It's perfectly okay to share with other people and a great website to check out before you arrive in Venice is www.venice-gondola-rides.com Here, you'll find a list of discounted gondola rides that can be as cheap as 30 euros per person much cheaper than the standard 80 euro tourist fee slapped on when booking in person. Some even have extras included, like free tours or airport transfers. If you don't fancy the extravagance of a gondola though, or simply can't afford it, another great way to enjoy the pleasures of riding on the Grand Canal is by Traghetto. Traghetto means ferry in Italian, and are the boats that carry passengers from one side of the Grand Canal to the other, of course, due to this it will be a short trip, but you will still ride in a gondola shaped boat, only without the fancy seats, decorations and serenader on the front. Quite often, the locals don't even bother to sit down. These boats are rowed by two oarsmen at both ends for efficiency and will only cost two euros per journey. There are seven in total, but they're often quite sporadic and hard to find. The easiest one to find is at the eastern side of the Rialto market and it takes you across towards Canareggio. As much as we do recommend walking everywhere in Venice to enjoy it to its full extent, if you do need to go somewhere quick, there are a number of public water buses called Vaporettos that go up and down the Grand Canal around the outskirts of Venice and to the many surrounding islands. A standard ticket fare comes in at a pricey €7.50 but what we would recommend is potentially getting a 24 hour ticket for 20 euros or a 7 day ticket for 60 euros. Especially for the easy access it will provide you to the lesser visited islands of Venice. For a slightly different experience you should definitely try and visit at least one of these lagoon islands. There are a few we will show you just now. Murano, Burano, Torcello and San Giorgio. The great thing is that if you leave early enough, you can visit all of these islands in one day. Murano Island is most famous for glass making. It all began back in 1291, when the people of Venice feared an outbreak of fire and sent all the glass blowers to live on the island. However, they soon found themselves gaining something of a celebrity status and were granted many privileges, such as being exempt from the law and having their daughters married into rich Venetian families. The secret of glass making became so secret that up until recently all glass blowers were required to live on the island to protect them. These days though, you can even occasionally find a free tour showing you a demonstration of these secrets. Just beware that you will get a rather aggressive sales pitch at the end of it. There is also a museum on the island where you can learn all about it. Murano is one of the closest islands to the main body of Venice and will take about 40 minutes by Vaporetto. The easiest way to get there is by taking the number 7 from the S. Zaccaria stop which is just up the promenade by St Mark's Square. This will take you directly to the island but just make sure you get off at the Murano Navigero stop. A boat comes by roughly every 20 minutes. Burano Island is another which you should give a visit. The main drawing point for this island is colour and its picturesque canals and painted houses make for the perfect photograph. Unusually, 
The colour of the houses follow a specific system, and if someone wishes to change theirs, they must first get the approval of the government. Other than this, Burano is also famous for lace making. Quite amazing really, considering how small an island it is. You can easily walk from one side to the other within 10 minutes. While walking, try and find the leaning bell tower on the church and question whether it's actually leaning or if it's just that your eyes are squint. The best way to get here is by going directly from the Murano Faro stop after you're finished on Murano. The 12 will take 37 minutes to reach Burano from here. However, if you want to go from S. Zakaria again, be prepared for a long journey, as taking the 14 from here will take around 70 minutes. If you take the 12 on your way to Burano, you'll first stop off on the island of Torcello. The majority of the land here is green nature reserve, and it could possibly be an idea to hop off here first if you're in the mood for a walk. Its main attractions are the two churches in the centre of the island. One of the best kept secrets of Venice is the San Giorgio Island. It's actually directly across the water from St Mark's Square and can again be reached from the S. Zicaria taking the number two water bus. The best thing about the island is the view you get when you go there. It provides a fantastic aerial view of Venice as a whole and of St Mark's also. At a cost of only six euros and with virtually no queues, San Giorgio Campanile rivals its busy cousin across the river. It opens from 9.30 until 6pm and until 2 on Sundays. And on that note, it's actually a great idea to stay on a rather large island, the mainland. Just outside of Venice, the main city is called Mestre and you might end up saving quite a bit by staying here commuting each day instead. So, here is a quick guide on staying here. Chances are that a dorm bed here in Mestre will cost around 20 euros per night, and that is much cheaper than the 35 to 40 euro price tag that you'll find in the centre of Venice. One to check out is the AO Hotel, which is a short two minute walk from Mestre Central Station. It's a large modernised hostel with good space for socialising. Other than this, there are many cheap hotels in Mestre where you'll find the same price for a private room as you would a dorm bed in Venice. Finding a supermarket in Mestre is fairly straightforward and there is a huge interspar within 10 minutes walking distance from the station. Go right when you come out of the station until you come to a bridge passing overhead. Turn left here and follow the road to the store. Although you'll probably spend the majority of your time in Venice, you may want to start your day off with some breakfast in this street. There are a number of bakeries near the station. If you go up Via Piave and take the fourth left, you'll go along Via Montenero. Here, at the bend, is Molenzan Bakery, a great place to boost your morning energy. So, to actually get into Venice from Mestre, there are two options. The easiest one is probably hopping on a train from the station and it'll take you straight to the edge of Canareggio in 10 minutes for as low as 1 euro 25. Alternatively, you can take the T1 tram from Mestre Centre, which costs 3 euros. Often, Venice is just as beautiful to explore at night as it is by day, and if you're going to get back to Mestre having lost track of time at some point, you'll need to know how to follow the street signs. The official signs are either yellow or white, and generally point to major destinations. Alla Ferrovia is the sign for the train station, and if you start to follow it, make sure you keep going straight until another one appears on a wall. If there are arrows pointing in two directions, don't get confused, it just means you can go either way. Close to the train station is another bargain to hunt. Baccaretto d'Alele is the type of place with such a community feel to it. You'll find students, boatmen and workers all come here for an ombra to start their day. Or in English, a small glass of wine. The place is exceptionally small and only fits a few people inside. For this reason, people start to spill out onto the street 
and this just adds to the warm and friendly atmosphere of the place. They are located directly on the canal front too, so it's a great idea to take one of the 60 cent ombras out and sit on the nearby steps. Just remember to return your glass afterwards. They also do mini paninis here that only cost a euro and it's difficult to find a spot in Venice as cheap as this one for lunch. From the tram stop, cross the bridge towards the Ghiardini, Papadopoli and follow the path until you come to another bridge. Once you cross this, you should see the bar on the right hand side just after the small plaza. It's open every day except Sunday, but shuts early at 2pm on a Saturday. I think it's about time we showed you how to find a good pizza. I mean, we are in Italy after all. Eocci is a typical tavern looking type restaurant and they do a great pizza for a great price. The secret here is again staying towards the outskirts and this one is just between the Santa Croce and San Polo areas. Bear in mind that the restaurants in Venice will generally charge a hefty service fee so it might even be an idea to take the pizza out and find a quiet spot close by. You'll find lots of little areas beside the canal just by the restaurant where you can perch your feet and relish the pizza. It might be an idea to pick up a nice local bottle of wine on your way to Venice from the Interspar and Mestre to enjoy with it. The majority of pizzas here will cost around €7.50 unless you're getting something a bit more fancy. It's open from lunchtime until 3 and closes again until 6.30 for dinner. Cross the bridge in front of the train station and walk down the alleyway past the Magnum shop. Take the second left just by the tourist shop and cross the bridge in front of you. Follow the canal at this point round to the right and keep going until you come to a sort of dead end by a bridge. There is a small alleyway here in the corner that is quite easy to miss. Follow it until you come to a two-way junction. Take a right. Again, easy to miss, take the second narrow alleyway to the right. Follow it, crossing the bridge you come to and taking the alley on the right. Once you emerge to the straight, the restaurant will be just on your right hand side. At this point, I think you realise just how much of a maze Venice is. If it wasn't hard enough to find the pizza restaurant, another hidden site to track down in Venice is the Scala Contarini del Bavolo. Contarini is named after the family who lived here and Bavolo is a Venetian word for snail. This staircase was built to act as a decoration to the palace it was next to at the time and is quite a beautiful sight to marvel at. Follow the yellow signs for the Academia Bridge until you come to the square Campo Manin. Here, on an alleyway to the left, you'll find a small plaque that is easy to miss and points out the direction of the staircase. Follow this pathway all the way and you'll come to a small courtyard where the staircase will tower over you. One fantastic experience you can have in Venice is going to see one of the many orchestras that perform in the surrounding churches. It can be a little pricey, but it will be well worth the money. Venetian composer Vivaldi is the most popular to play between musicians. Understandable, considering he was a local, and it can be quite moving to witness his four seasons being played in such small, intimate conditions. On musicinvenice.com, you'll find a list of groups that perform these symphonies. You can select and view by location as well if there's a specific place you would like to discover the atmosphere of. There are many beautiful venues and they range from small to large in size. Alternatively, if you want to see some music on the cheap, the best place to do it, believe it or not, is our final stop, St Mark's Square. At night, the classy restaurants surrounding the square often have small groups of musicians playing to the customers that sit and dine here. Even though it's technically for the customers, that's not to say you can't just stand a short distance from them and still enjoy it. Actually, the music reverberates so well, you can generally still hear it standing in the centre of the square. And at night, you'll find that it's so quiet here that you could even have a romantic dance in it. The square is actually the centre core of Venice, and the area that it's in is the original area that Venice was built upon. It can be traced back to as far as 828 when the original basilica was built. It was originally built to house the treasures that were stolen from Alexandria in Egypt. 
but since then, the place has become lined with treasures on both the outside and inside, most coming from the sack of Constantinople. The basilica is surrounded by the Doge's Palace, which in the past was housed to the most important authority figure in Venice. The square, basilica and palace are all overshadowed by the Campanile. This tower served as a guard post and also to communicate messages to the citizens of Venice. This was done by ringing one of the five bells of the Campanile. Each had a different meaning, but the most sinister was definitely if you heard the smallest bell being rung. This was to announce the execution of prisoners who most of the time were locked in cages halfway up the Campanile's walls. All of these attractions can be visited, but you'll be hit with steep tourist prices and long queues if you want to go inside. Best to stay outside, have a look, and just chase some pigeons instead. And that wraps up our guide to Venice. We hope you enjoyed your stay here, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel below for many more tips and tricks on all the hidden cities that we will explore.